everyone here so good to be here, sons and daughters of the Most High God. It's great to be able to share uh, with you this morning. So we're going to be, the whole theme of the assembly is join the adventure. And it's about us building together for God's kingdom. I'm sure you will have heard a bit about me, uh, but in true millennial style. Please do follow me on all of my social media. <laughs> uh, but just give me a like, give me a follow, give me a subscribe. You'll notice I'm vlogging my uh, way through this transition period and my presidential uh, theme of building a bigger table. So weekly, I will drop a vlog explaining a little bit about the life of the association and all that the transition holds. And I do that so no one can say we don't know what the regional team are doing. Okay, it's there, it's on YouTube every week. A little bit about me, so I grew up in a non-Christian household. When I was 17, I had a vision of Jesus, uh, and God told me to read the Bible, so I started reading the Bible. Um, and then I knocked on the Baptist church door and said, I, I want to follow Jesus. Uh, I know he died for me, uh, and I want to follow him. And uh, so the minister at the time, he's a great friend of mine now, who used to work for Care for the Family, Richard Harvey, said to me, we'll come to church. So I did, and I went to church, and I went, I don't get it. I've fallen in love with Jesus, and I've read the Bible, and this is, this is what we've got. <coughs> and, and right then, God was calling me into ministry. And part of that is, is extending the table, I believe, and I'm going to take that theme into my presidential year. So people often say, you're quite excited, you get quite excited about the gospel. I'm excited about the gospel because it saves, it's the power, amen? amen? And so that's why we are joining the adventure. God's already on the adventure. You and I today have a choice of whether we're going to partner in that or stay in our chairs. But we as NMBA, is our slogan is building together for God's kingdom. And I really wanted to give these out. Uh, to you at my induction, but because of everything, we did the induction online and I actually missed the post that day. So that was quite good. But I've got one of these for every church and it's a jigsaw piece. And my challenge is that when I come and visit the church, when Paul and I come and visit the church, is that these are somewhere, not under a desk. <laughs> I know what I was like as a minister. But in it, it just simply says, MBA building together for God's kingdom. You on your own as a church are great. You're steady. You're doing well. But when we are together, there is a better strength. And we all, all 50 of our churches and missional communities, have a place to part in building God's kingdom together. So yes, we can do it on our own, but let's remember that we are part of a bigger jigsaw. And the reality is that those 50 churches and missional communities aren't limited to the northeast, but it expands the 2,000 plus churches and missional communities of our Baptist family. But the budget didn't stretch that far, so we've just got 50 <laughs> churches here. But this morning, I want to just share with you two passages of scripture. It's my kind of responsibility to do the encouraging bit. And then Paul is going to lead some missional stories after that. And don't worry, there's coffee in between. But I want to just uh, start by reading from Luke chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles with you, if they're on an iPhone or an uh, Android or an iPad, or just, just the Bible, that would be great. And look at Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. It says this. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way for the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowd from the boat. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long and have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signalled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord. But I am a sinful man. 
for he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catches of people. When they brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. It's amazing. It's well known, isn't it? So just indulge me because we've known this story for a while. But at this part of the gospel story, we reach the point where Jesus' fame is beginning to spread. People want to know about him. They want to see the miracles. Because actually, they weren't necessarily drawn to Jesus because of the things he said. They were drawn because of the miracles, the things he was performing. So crowds wanted to come and see, what what was Jesus going to do next? And that's where we pick up this account. Jesus is by the sea. The crowds are gathered around him, pressing in on him. The situation potentially could have become quite tense. People wanted to know what was going to happen. So to avoid the crush, Jesus steps in to a boat belonging to a man called Simon Peter, a fisherman. Not only was he a fisherman, he was a fisherman at the end of his shift. And Jesus pops into the boat and he says to Simon, who's sitting there packing up his nets, let's go fishing. Now I expect Simon at this point was looking forward to getting home. Putting his feet up and forgetting about the day he just had. Because let's be honest, he's been fishing all night and caught nothing. He was ready to go home. He was tired. Obviously he was disappointed because he'd been up all night, caught nothing, and suddenly Jesus turns up and says, let's go fishing. Now, if I was Simon Peter, I might be thinking, you've got to be kidding me. I'm a fisherman. My dad was a fisherman. His dad was a fisherman. His dad was a fisherman. I know these waters. I've been fishing all night and caught nothing. But okay, Mr. Carpenter, if you say let's go fishing, then let's go. And sure enough, Simon Peter and Jesus go fishing. He may even have been writing his I told you so speech in his head to give to Jesus. But then, the most incredible thing happens. The boats begin to sway. The nets, they begin to creep. And then they pull. And as they pull, they end up flapping of hundreds of fish on the top of their nets. It's almost deafening. And Simon Peter has to call to his mates, please come and help. We've got so much, we need you. Our boats are going to sink with the abundance. We don't know what to do with all these fish. And you know the truth is, my friends, this morning, that the God we worship, the God we serve, is far bigger than we can ever imagine or fully comprehend. And the truth is, our God loves to blow our minds with the miraculous doings of his work. And Jesus uses this miracle to say, Hey, Simon Peter, you think this is amazing? You wait and see what I've got in store for you. Wait and see. The best is yet to come. And what Jesus said to Simon Peter that day, I believe Jesus is saying to all of our churches here in the NBA, the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. We're still awake. Come on, guys. Amen. The best is yet to come. Amen. If we don't believe it, they're not going to believe it. You see, post-lockdown, maybe there's a tendency to think, well, do you know what? We've been toiling. It's been hard work. We're tired at the moment. We are burdened. What we do is we're just wait. We'll just spend some time washing our nets. We'll wait for the new regional minister to come up with the new strategy. <laughs> then, whatever that will be, we'll reassess the situation and then we'll go again. You know what? Simon Peter was not a man who was used because he was willing. It was because he was great. He was used because he was willing. And I believe what Jesus said to Simon Peter that day, Jesus says to us now. 
Now is not the time to go home. Now is not the time to wash our nets and forget about it. There is still a harvest which needs to be caught. And this, you guys are the group of people that God is going to use to bring about his kingdom. Don't give up. Don't go home. Don't wash your nets. Jesus says, let's go fishing. And you know, what amazes me is Simon Peter's response. He just follows. But he doesn't do it without a revelation. You see, Peter, as I said, was willing. He was willing to take the next step. Despite being an absolute expert in his field, despite knowing the waters better than anybody else, he decided to listen to Jesus. He could have sat down with Jesus at that moment and said, look, Jesus, this is the reasons why it won't work. I know these waters. I've read the books about it. I know the theory. We've done this before. Let me tell you why that won't work, Jesus. He doesn't. He's willing enough to give it another go. He put all of his experience, all of his professional training, which would have been crying out within him, this is ridiculous. He puts all of that aside in order to give God control. Now, please don't hear me wrong. Studying, training, professional experience is good. But sometimes God calls us to do the ridiculous, seemingly ridiculous. We have to be willing to be fools for the gospel. Because sometimes God will ask us to do something that doesn't necessarily make sense in the natural But God is in control. Just like Simon Peter, you and I today need to be willing to follow Jesus, even if it feels uncomfortable, even if it goes against our common sense. Don't forget, this is the guy that later witnessed over 2,000 people coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. He was willing in a small act. I wonder... Where is God asking you to be obedient in willingness? The best is yet to come. But we have to be willing to hear the Master's voice. The other thing is, he was humble. In that boat that day, Simon Peter got a glimpse of who God was. When that catch came in, he caught the very nature of who who Jesus was. Fully human and yet fully divine. And as a result, he humbled himself before Jesus. And the amazing truth is today that God doesn't actually need us. Let's be real. God doesn't need us. But God chooses. God chooses to partner with you and me in bringing about the catch. God chooses you. You have a part to play in the story of bringing God's kingdom together in the Northern Baptist Association. Every single one of us has. Sometimes we can have a tendency to put the church leader in that place. Oh, we don't have to send gifts as they do. You probably don't, but you have gifts. What is God calling you to do in your place, in your community, in your church? When the people of God respond with humility and say, here I am, I want to work with you, we become this amazing instrument of God's grace. And then we see, don't we, Simon Peter leaves everything to follow Jesus. He leaves a fishing business, he leaves his livelihood, he leaves his family, all for the sake of Jesus. Now, that calling may not be yours to leave everything in that same way. But are you willing to understand what Simon Peter did? That there is no greater calling than the one to follow Jesus. You see, so many people put the the crux of the Christian journey on that three-point prayer. Coming to know Jesus. And that's important. I guess we can chat about that over coffee. But following Jesus isn't a one-off decision. 
It's a daily outworking of a living prayer within us. Choosing to die to self and follow him. It starts with acknowledging who God is, repenting of our sin. It starts with coming under the Lordship of Christ and following him, laying down everything. And I've got to ask, why? Why would we want to live in any other place than under God's authority? And so the encouragement for us is that the best is yet to come. Jesus is calling us to go fishing with him. And my question to you this morning is, are you ready to go fishing? Are you willing to go fishing? I can see a few knots, which is great. (laughs) And maybe the answer is yes, but. Yes, but. Hayley, you've got no idea what I'm going through at the moment. And I don't. I don't. But how are we going to respond when we're sitting here thinking, but we've tried. Hayley, you're saying nothing new. We know this, we've read this, we've been encouraged to do this time and time again. We're tired. How do we do this in a fresh and new way? How do we make the gospel relevant to people? How do we prevent ourselves from only sharing the message with those who look like us? What do we do when people reject us? What do we do when we get it wrong? And so I want to share with you uh, an account from the scriptures. Because I think when we talk about mission, when we talk about adventure, yes, we can get all fired up and excited with the let's go fishing, but there's also a reality of how do we do mission in a, in a context like the ones we're living in today? How do we prevent ourselves from only going to those that are like us? And I want to retell a story that, if I'm honest, the first time I read it made me angry at Jesus. It's an account of a woman who's crying out to Jesus for help because her daughter is possessed and suffering. It's found in Mark 7, if you want to look at it. This woman is crying out to Jesus to help her daughter. And what does Jesus do? He ignores her. She continues to beg for his help. The disciples grow impatient with the woman. They ask Jesus to send her away because she won't stop shouting at them for help. He tells them he won't deal with her because he's sent only for the lost sheep of Israel. She must have heard him say those words because she fell at his feet and she begs for help for her daughter. Then finally Jesus speaks to her saying, Woman, it is not right to take food from the children's mouths and throw it to the dogs. Ouch! Quickly she says to him, of course you're right, but even the dogs get the crumbs at the table. Jesus then praises her faith and heals her daughter. But did you catch that? Did you catch it? Jesus ignored a desperate and pleading woman. He tells his disciples she isn't worth his time. He insults her by calling her a dog. As if being a woman in this culture isn't enough of a hill to climb. She's a cultural outsider to Jesus and his boys in every way. And she's making a nuisance of herself in front of the crowd. And rather than immediately leaping over those hurdles to welcome her and heal her daughter, Jesus seemingly ignores her. He insults her and he refuses her. There's no empathy, no compassion from the way that the story is written. She persists. She refuses to let these men talk about her as if she's not there. She gets in the way. She doesn't get angry. She gets clever. And Jesus throws up his hands in the best, knowing he's been. Perhaps he even laughs, fine, you win. She gets what she wants. Her daughter is healed. And in this account, unlike the first one, we're reminded a bit too strongly that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Sometimes we can lean so much into Jesus' divinity we forget he also is a product of his time and culture, just like us. 
And I'm sharing that with you because it shocked me. It shocks me. But perhaps Jesus was taught by this woman. Perhaps we're witnessing here Jesus' growth. Perhaps he was deeply struggling with his Jewish identity and the attitudes of the day. Perhaps he was conditioned to ignore people like her. Perhaps it was because she was a woman or her cultural identity or her race. After all, Jesus was fully human as he was God. So perhaps he had the capacity to be challenged on his cultural perspectives, then to grow and move on. In Mark's telling of this account, this is Jesus' first conversation with the Gentile, and it wouldn't be his last. But never again would he treat anyone like this. Never again did he treat anyone the way he initially treated this woman. The theologian Austin Stillman writes, Jesus shows us in this story that inheriting bias is inevitable, but holding on to it is a choice. I've thought often about this woman since first reading the story. I think of of it often when I think about missional adventure and what does it mean for me to be a kingdom person. The first time I've read this, it made me mad at Jesus. How can this amazing God that I believe in act in this way? But actually, it's really instructive. And it's even convicting for us as a church today. Perhaps Jesus learnt in this moment. A woman taught him, he responded. The whole of scripture, the whole of the Bible shows us a God who is moved by compassion, a God who is persuaded, a God who responds, a God who is always moving towards us. And in this account, unlike the first one, Jesus isn't the hero, even though he ultimately heals the child. This woman, who is persistent, unrelenting, clever, turns insults into opportunities, prevailed. She's an outsider who showed the insiders how it should be done in the kingdom of God. And my friends, that is the reality if we want to go fishing today. That's the reality. If we want to see the best is yet to come, if we want people to experience the amazing, awesome, healing, powerful nature of Jesus Christ, we have to acknowledge who we are. Just as Jesus did in this account. Sometimes we're caught out by our biases. But ultimately, we have an amazing adventure before us. God is already bringing everyone to his table. You and I can be part of that. But first, we have to realise that we're products of who we are. And I say that as an inspiration and a challenge. Jesus didn't get it right in this situation. We don't always get it right. But what is different is Jesus allowed himself to be taught and never again did he act in that same way. And maybe that's what it's like for us when we're joining the adventure, when we're reaching out in mission, when we catch ourselves in our unconscious bias, when we find ourselves only hanging out with those who are like us. Let us be open to hear the voice of God from the outside who shows us what the kingdom of God is really like. And you may be saying, but Haley, what does that mean for me and my church right now? How do I go back and share that with others? I want to fish. I want to fish and I, I want to be open to everyone and I want to be like Jesus. I want to be teachable. What does it look like? Well, let me share this image with you. It's a it's a well-known image, and you've probably seen it before, and Roy's smiling, I probably nicked it off something he did. But it shows us that the adventure sometimes, and we will hear stories after coffee that Paul's going to lead us in, of different experiences of people joining in the adventure. 
And often we can think joining in the adventure is right out on that boat doing the, doing the really weird stuff, doing the wacky stuff that we can't comprehend as church. But all of us have a step to move. And so I wonder where you would put your church on that spectrum. Are you a church replicator, an adapter, an innovator, or an activist? Where are you? What does that look like? What do I mean when I say that? Well, for some of us, mission and adventure means opening up our coffee morning to different people. For some of us, mission and adventure looks like a messy church, a cafe church. For some of us, mission and adventure means putting a sofa outside our church and having a cup of tea and chatting to those who come past. For some of us, Mission of Adventure means painting a park bench. For some of us, Mission of Adventure means leaving everything, buying a home in a new housing estate and being incarnation. For some of us, Mission of Adventure looks like moving into the rough side of town rolling up our sleeves and modelling Jesus. And what we want to say to you, what we as the MBA want to say to you today, is mission and adventure is mission and adventure for you. I don't mean to be flippant, but Paul and I don't really care if you do a messy church or move into a new housing estate. What we care about is if you're being Jesus' hands and feet in the place where he's called you. And we're here as a team to help equip and empower you in that. We can share stories. We can show what others are doing. But ultimately, we want to see you embrace missional adventure where it's at. And not be afraid of getting it wrong. Because my friends, what's the worst that can happen? Someone says, someone hears about Jesus. That's the worst that can happen. And if that's the worst that can happen, we're starting from a good place, friends. What does that look like? Well, many of you will know, I've mentioned it several times, my my presidency theme is building a bigger table. You see, from this account that we read, in the two accounts that we've read, Jesus calls his disciples. He calls you. Those same disciples he's caught in a state of what I believe is unconscious bias. He changes his behaviour from that moment. And from that moment, how does Jesus hang out? How does Jesus interact with those on the outside? Well, he shares a meal with them. He gets in trouble. People go, what's he doing? What's he doing sharing with those sinners? And I want to encourage you today, wherever you are, to be like Jesus. Simple, isn't it? You don't need to come here for me to tell you that. Be like Jesus. Call those around you that will walk the discipleship journey with you. And then reach out in a hospitable way, knowing that you'll make mistakes. You see, Jesus, after this moment, after this encounter, changed the way he behaved. He risked his reputation to hang out with sinners. You and I have the opportunity to do the same right now. We just need to be willing, we need to be humble, and we need to follow. And I wonder what the MBA will look like if we start doing that. If we start seeing Mission and Adventure of somewhere along this spectrum, taking that small step, following Christ, and who knows? Maybe like Simon Peter, we'll end up seeing 2,000 people come to faith in one moment. And then, we've got to believe it. So we don't believe it, other people won't. What I'm going to ask you to do is just to, we're just going to sit in silence for a moment. And then I'm going to ask you to reflect on something in twos and threes. But let's just sit and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us.